Raise your hand if you know how to sail. You actually know how to sail. Nobody. Me either. A little bit. Oh, up there. They know how to sail up there. What do you say? Every weekend. And you the same? Kind of. Well, I, I cannot raise my hand. I don't know how to sail. My, my two grandparents were in the Navy, uh, but I wouldn't qualify as a sailor. They would be uh, that way. I have been sailing. If you raise your hand, if you've been sailing, right? Okay. So some of us have been sailing. And I've been sailing twice in my life. One was when I was 12 years old. I was in Lake Erie with a buddy of mine and his dad. And his dad owned this big sailboat. And we went from Port Clinton to Putin Bay, stayed the night, and came back. But on the way back, I thought it was we were going to sink this boat. We weren't. But I'd never been on a sailboat, and the wind was just blowing in Lake Erie, and the waves were white caps, and my buddy's dad was thrilled because he grew up sailing on Long Island on the ocean. And this is a typical day on the ocean of sailing. Uh, so this wind didn't bother him. He just knew how to harness the wind. Even though our boat was like this, our backs were almost in the water, it felt like. Uh, I was terrified. But then the second time I was, in, I was in upstate New York, and I learned how to sail a little sunfish sailboat. And it was the coolest thing ever to kind of figure out how to move that sail to harness the wind, and that boat just took off. And then move it around and turn that little boat. The reason I sail is because uh, we can't control the wind, uh, the wind's going to blow where it wants to blow, how strong, how soft, it doesn't matter. I can't, nobody can control the wind. But we can control our response to the wind. Sailors understand how to respond to the wind and put the sail in the appropriate place to make the ship or the boat go forward. And that's their response in the midst of adversity, that is, the strong wind. Today we're talking about adjusting to things beyond our control. We're going to look at Psalm 131. And also the last day of Jesus' life, as we look at, examine the reality that we all are in at almost sometimes weekly. Uh, globally, there's things beyond our control that give us a lot of anxiety. And sometimes there's personal things in our lives that are beyond our control that give us anxiety. But there's things we can learn from the people before us, Psalm 131, and Jesus himself about how to navigate, how to respond to those things beyond our control and do it in a grace-filled, centered way. Right. Uh, this morning, uh, first off, we'll be reading responsively from Psalm 131. My heart is not proud, Lord, and my eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I'm content. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forever. Second lesson today comes from the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. The Son is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning of and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to recon reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies of your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature 
under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Our gospel lesson this morning is from St. Luke chapter 22, verses 63 through 71. The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, Prophesy, who hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. If you are the Messiah, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I asked you, you wouldn't answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, are you then the Son of God? He replied, you say that I am. Then they said, why do we need more testimony? We've heard it from his own lips. The Gospel of the Lord. So what is this morning beyond your control? You say, well, everything, Pastor Mike. Uh, Yes, there's a lot of things that are beyond our control globally. But sometimes in our personal lives, there are things that cause us a lot of anxiety or worry or uh, difficulty. And we get lost. It's a human nature to get lost in things beyond our control. And it causes sleepless nights, anxiety, sometimes depression as well. For us, uh, my wife and I, what hits close to home for us, my wife, in, on just over a week, has having surgery, and so that's a little bit, that's beyond our control. It's in the control and the hands of medical professionals we trust, uh, but then that's even, I mean, outcomes sometimes are beyond control as well. So we're trusting in them, but also trusting in God, but that's the reality of where we find ourselves for our family, but you probably have something as well that is beyond your control, that potentially is causing some difficulty, some nervousness, some worry, anxiety, and as I said, even depression. Psalm 131 is a perfect psalm for understanding how to adjust to things that are beyond our control. It's a beautiful psalm of three verses as, uh, that talks about hope. And it gives us a beautiful picture of what hope looks like. We'll get to that in a second. But we are in this series, we're finishing up today, of these psalms for ordinary life. And these are psalms that the Israelites, even Jesus and his family, sang as in the first century as they made pilgrimage from their town ascending to Jerusalem. And there are 14 psalms in the book of Psalms called the Psalms of Ascent, and we're calling them Psalms of Ordinary Life. And the ordinary life today is adjusting to things beyond our control. Psalm 131 begins this way. Uh, Paul read it, but let me read it again. Um, It says, My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. Now, we might pause there and say, what are the great matters and things too wonderful for me? And there's two ways of looking looking at that. One is about ambition. You know, even the psalmist says, my heart's not proud. And so the psalmist is saying, look, it's about Part of it is thinking greater of myself than I should think. That I can accomplish more than I really probably could accomplish. And it's making, it's beyond my control, the outcome of this or that thing. And it's causing me anxiety. That's one way. Because I'm puffed up with pride. That's beyond me. But the other way of looking at it, because the psalm is directly rooted in the reality of hope is this beyond our control because I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me, or that is, things that are beyond me that I cannot even have any influence over. And that's where we're going to land today. And Psalm, the verse, second verse leads us into deeper hope. It gives us a picture of what this looks like. I have calmed and quieted myself. Other translation says, I have calmed and quieted myself my soul. So the deeper sense of contentment in the midst of the swirling uncertainty. There's a deeper contentment. I've calmed and quieted my soul or myself. 
I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. That is a weaned child and with its mother, with her mother. I reason, uh, I know that is because where I got this picture, I typed in weaned child. This picture came up. And I went, yep, that's a weaned child with, his, with her mother. Now, how do we know that? You know what to wean off something is? Like we wean off medications or we wean off something. That is, we're distancing ourselves from complete dependence upon. Children are weaned from their parents. And that's the natural progression of maturity. This is good. We do not want an 18-year-old, 19-year-old completely clinging to mom and dad every day. That'd be terrible. It'd be, we would, if, if our boys would do that, we've not done our job as a parent. Because it sows independence when we wean, in, wean children off their parents. Well, the psalmist says, hope is pictured this way. Now, this weaned child, this daughter of this mom, she's not completely independent and separate from her mom. There's a connection happening there, right? She is, somewhat, she is still dependent on her mom, but she's now starting to make decisions on her own and, and able to calm herself down. As an infant, she can't do that. She needs mom or dad to come and pick her up and help calm her down. But as she's growing in years, she can now enter situations that upset her and now can feel like, okay, I can, I can calm myself even though I might need a hug for my mom. It's a loving connection of contentment with her mom. And the psalmist says, this is the picture of what hope looks like. What, in the midst of the storms of life, where things are adverse, or we get worried or anxious about, we trust that there's one bigger than us in our own household. Like she is, doesn't have to bring home the income for her family. Her mom does, or her dad does. She doesn't go to the grocery store, mom or dad do. She doesn't drive to the hospital, mom or dad do, because mom and dad are there to take care of her. And the psalmist says, that's our relationship with the God who loves us. We have hope because, yes, we make decisions and we can calm ourselves, but we can calm ourselves because we know there's one who loves us, who takes care of us in the midst of the swirling uncertainty all around us. Martin Luther uh, had a number of troubles throughout his life. He was an intense man of faith, who uh, led the Reformation of the church, as we all know, uh, wrote extensively on, and studied the scriptures, but did not, did, that did not uh, take him away from suffering. He lost a child at one point, a daughter. He suffered from physical ailments to the, to the very end of his life. He suffered loneliness and isolation and, 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 and depression throughout his life. Um, there was one point later in his life he told his wife, Katie, I'm done. I want to be finished with my life. And he was really brutal, brutally honest with the struggles he faced. While that was true, and this, that is, the physical ailments and the depression and the isolation and loneliness, and he experienced that isolation and loneliness particularly for a year as he spent time at Wartburg Castle. He was being protected by the prince from the religious authorities who were out literally to kill him. But he spent the entire year by himself. And it was incredibly painful. He writes about it. He writes to his friends that year how isolated and lonely he felt. It was beyond his control to leave that place. And he, matter of fact, in those days, he would say the devil was tormenting him. And there's a famous thing where he took some ink, an inkwell, and threw it against the wall as if he was throwing it against the devil. He was trying every day to adjust to things beyond his control. And people then would write to him later on in his life about difficulties they were facing. And there's all these letters that we still have. And Jerome was one person. We don't know who Jerome was, but it was a person who wrote to Luther about some difficulties he was facing beyond his control. And Luther's advice was this. Jerome, be of good courage and cast these dreadful thoughts out of your mind. Whenever the devil pesters you with these thoughts at once, at once, 
seek out the company of men, drink more, joke and jest, or engage in some other form of merriment. Now, he's not telling Jerome to pretend it doesn't exist. But what is he saying? Don't stay by yourself. It will, you will descend deeper in the darkness. But Jerome, go find your friends. Joke around. Because God loves you. And you can't make that control the situation, but you can tend control your response. Now, drink more doesn't mean he's going to go escape into alcohol. That's not Luther's point. But that's part of an entire picture that says, go find some enjoyment. Go do something. Get out. Luther even said this. When he felt the most depressed that was beyond him, he would go out to feed his pigs. So Luther's advice was, spend some time with your pigs or with your friends. It doesn't matter. Just go, get out and do something. But early on in his life, and this is where we get to Jesus, when Luther was at the monastery, he was racked with, with shame, guilt, anxiety, and so many things beyond him. He would daily, and sometimes multiple times during the day, go to his confessor. That is, somebody who would confess his sins to. It was somebody above him. And that guy, whose name was Johann von Staupitz. And von Staupitz would always give Luther the same piece of advice. And it's this. Look to the wounds of Christ. Luther, look to the wounds of Christ. Luther, look to the wounds of Christ. And why would John von Staupitz say this? Why would he say, Luther, in the midst of your anxiety, your depression, your shame, your getting lost in things you can't control, why would he say, now focus here? Because this is the one, Jesus, who did the same thing. Here's the beautiful thing of Jesus. I love Jesus for so many reasons. But if you and I would just spend and meditate on Jesus' last day of his crucifixion and take these words to heart, we would find one who entered a day beyond his control and yet remained controlled. The one who stilled the storm, do you think he was still in his own storm? Yes or no? Look, on that last day, we read it. He was being led places. He was being blindfolded. He was being spit upon and mocked. He was being questioned. He spent a sleepless night in jail as an innocent man. There are so many. He was led. He was forced to carry his cross. He was led to his place of his death. He did not put the nails in his own hand or his feet. They put that in him for him without his choosing. The one, as Paul writes, and Paul read this from Colossians, there's this beautiful, I love Colossians, and Colossians says this, Paul says, all things were created for Jesus Christ, and in him all things hold together. Now that's Paul's words following the resurrection. But here's the irony of Jesus' last day. The one who holds all things together entered a time where it felt like things were not all together. The one who does not, as the prophets say, does not willingly afflict us, was willingly afflicted for us. He placed himself in a vulnerable position that he was not in control of for our sake. So if Jesus can enter his last day stilled in his own storm, it behooves us to follow Staupitz's advice as he gave to Luther, he gives to us. Look at the wounds of Christ. And let that be the center. How did Jesus get through that day? Because he knew his God, the Father, was not going to let him down. He knew that this was part of a larger story being told. The one who writes our lives in a book allowed his life to be written on a day. It's beautiful. He knew God the Father had a resurrection three days from now, which could allow him to, in his soul, be calmed, even though it wasn't calm outside. 
His soul could be calmed because he knew the promise was certain. He could depend on it. God the Father is not going to let him down. And so we can move in this moment of deep difficulty and pain with courage and hope, centered not on this, but centered on this, in deep inside. And you say, well, Pastor Mike, that's Jesus. I know. But as followers of Jesus, and that we're in our baptism by the Holy Spirit, God, Jesus places himself in us. So his life is now in our lives. So that when we face our own storms and uncertainties and all this stuff and depression and just darkness, be personal lives or globally, that we go, this is craziness. But I know there's one deep in me who lives in me, who is still the calm part of my being, my soul. And we can echo the psalmist by saying, I've stilled and quieted my soul because there's one bigger than this moment that loves me, who takes care of me, and sees me through it. So I don't need to focus here, I focus here. And that pulls me through a difficult day. Even Jesus, on the res- after the resurrection, Jesus says, I just read this this morning, at the end of Luke's gospel, it says that the disciples were upset because of Jesus' crucifixion. They're worried and anxious and doubtful. And Jesus shows up in their midst as the resurrected one and says this, Why are your hearts troubled and why do doubts arise in you? Jesus said. And he said, then he says this to the disciples, Look at my hands and my feet. So before Staupitz said this, Jesus himself centered his disciples as they were going through difficulty by saying, look at my wounds, my hands and my feet. Then in words, if God could raise Jesus from the dead, that changes everything. Everything. It changes the way my wife and I approach her surgery. Because God's bigger than that. And God will never let us down. Ever, ever, ever. And we can bank on it. And here's the thing. As you take this gift today, it's a gift, the body and blood of Jesus. It's a way to look on the wounds of Christ again. It's a way to take in now the promise again. It's a way to taste and see that the Lord is indeed good. It's a way to experience the love of God fully embodied in yourself. Because he's given himself to us again. This is his wounds we're looking on. His body and blood. And lastly, this. This is from the book, uh, Companions in the Darkness. Diane Groover, I encourage you to read it. It's a great book. It uh, just came out this year. And Diane Groover says this about uh, that phrase, look to the wounds of Christ. Look to the wounds of Christ, she writes, for this is where we see the extent of God's love. The upside down way he brings beauty and wholeness the full measure of his grace. It is where we are reminded of truth outside of our feelings, that nothing can separate us from God's love, not even the deepest depression. Look, we can't control things, but we, we can control our response to things. And our response is out of, first and foremost, the hope that we hang on to, cling to the promises of God. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for your love that's found us, your love that's here, the people you surround us with, reminders and visible evidences of your love for us. We thank you for your body and blood, your bread and wine that you give us, another example, another reality that we ingest of your love for us. And so we pray that you would still and calm our souls with this hope, this peace that passes understanding. In Christ's name, amen.